Welcome to this new Faith Groups small group study from Faith Lutheran Church. Our theme this year is impossible. Are all things possible with God? Hello and welcome back for session four of our Faith Group series, Impossible. We pray that these series, these sessions have been a blessing to you and remind you that if, if you want to talk further about any of these topics, feel free to contact us. And that may be especially important for today's topic. I do a lot of weddings, and that's okay because I love to do them. I enjoy doing them. It's fun to be a part of people's special day. It's uh, a lot of fun getting to know couples before the wedding, and it's wonderful to see a happily married new couple in church on Sunday afterwards. But even though I've been doing a lot of weddings for just a few years, the unfortunate truth is that not every couple that I've joined together in holy matrimony is still in holy matrimony. There are broken people and broken marriages. One of my favorite parts about the marriage liturgy are the three statements that come right before they exchange vows with one another. That first statement declares the Lord God in his goodness created us male and female and by the gift of marriage founded human community in a joy that begins now and is brought to perfection in the life to come. Marriage is a gift. Sometimes we have to be reminded about that, but it's a gift. It is a God-ordained blessing given to men and women. It is the gift of community, of oneness, and of joy. When God looked at Adam, he declared, it's not good for man to be alone. He needs help. Can I get an amen from the ladies out there? Yeah, I'm sure. So God created animals. He tried dogs. He tried horses. He tried cats. Well, maybe not cats. But he tried all of these, but no helper could be found. So God created woman. And upon seeing the woman, Adam declares, at last, bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, he was complete. And the two became one, and marriage was created. Well, then there's that second statement from the marriage liturgy. Because of sin... Our age-old rebellion, the gladness of marriage can be overcast, and the gift of family can become a burden. When one sinner marries another sinner, well, sin happens. We see this right away, just a few verses later in Genesis chapter 3. Busted for their transgression, Adam caught red-handed deflects. Well, uh, this woman that you gave me, it's her fault. She made me do it, is, it seems like he's saying. He went from bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh completion to this woman you gave me. What happened there in the marriage relationship? And we don't see this, uh, and we don't just see this in our relationships. We, we go from, I take you to be my spouse from this day forward to, I can't take you anymore. Let me show you how this played out in my family. So, my dad, when he was in the Air Force, met this little Asian woman, actually, little Asian woman, my mom. They got married, they had me and my sister, Jennifer. Well, then, uh, it didn't, it, then things turned for the worse, and they got divorced. So my dad remarried my stepmom, Ellen. She already had a kid uh, from a previous marriage, and together they had my brother, Peter, my half-brother, Peter. Well, uh, 
my my uh, my mom and I, my stepmom and I, we didn't get along very well. It was pretty tough. But if if it was tough for me, it was even tougher for my sister. This relationship was really dysfunctional. They just hated each other, and as a result, this relationship between my stepsister and my sister was just as bad. They were about the same age. They did not get along. Well, my stepmom, uh, about 10 years ago, she uh, died of cancer. And my dad remarried again to uh, Mary. Mary had two daughters from a previous relationship. So I have, let's see, my stepsister count is up to three. All right, we follow along at home. Meanwhile, on this side, my mom married Jim. Jim had uh, two daughters from a previous relationship. So that's five stepsisters. And two more from a relationship uh, after that, a marriage after that. So we're up to seven stepsisters. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that marriage didn't last. Um, they got divorced and uh, uh, my mom has not remarried. So right now my count stands at seven stepsisters, a real sister, and a half brother. And this is the new normal in our society today. It's, it's craziness and, and step uh, families, blended families is, uh, is, is the norm when it comes to um, our relationships. So what happened here? Well, St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, uh, to, the, to the married I give this command, he says, not, but, uh, but not I, but the Lord. So the Lord is giving this command. That the wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does separate, let her re remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And that the husband should not divorce his wife. And yet, the Bible and history, and our society, and my family is riddled with broken marriages, dysfunctional relationships, and broken people. Research has shown that almost 50% of all marriages in the United States will end in divorce or separation. Researchers estimate that 41% of all first marriages will end in divorce, that 60% of all second marriages will end in divorce, and that 73% of all third marriages will end in divorce. The United States has the sixth highest divorce rate in the world. It's bleak. Over the last few years, the divorce race has actually decreased, although I think in part that's because fewer people are actually getting married. Um, they don't want to make a binding arrangement that are difficult to break. The holy estate of marriage is in tough shape, which is why that third statement in the wedding liturgy is important. And that reads, but because God, who established marriage, continues still to bless it with his abundant an ever-present support. We can be sustained in our weariness and have our joy restored. Well, first of all, whenever you're reading scripture and, and you see a sentence start with, but God, well then buckle up, because usually there's good news to follow. And while this isn't scripture, it is good news, because God, the creator and ordainer of marriage is still at work in marriage. He's at work blessing it with his presence. He's at work sustaining us in our weariness, and he's at work to restore our joy. But don't be fooled. It's a lot of hard work. So for those of you that are watching this that are married, especially for those of you experiencing difficulty in your marriage, well, take heart, work hard, find help, submit to one another, forgive, find a counselor to meet with, and know 
that God can turn your weariness back into joy. And for those of you that have experienced divorce, my heart goes out to you. I know that that wasn't your desire for your marriage. I know how difficult that decision was for you. And I, and I want you to know that you are forgiven and loved by God and know that he can turn your weariness back into joy and know that it's not, it's, it is still not good for you to be alone. And so find community and plug in to the body of Christ. And for those of you that are not yet married, or, but are, in a, uh, are planning to or, in a, uh, uh, or plan to be in a relationship or are currently in a relationship, well, maybe you're thinking that you don't ever want to tie the knot because you've seen marriages fail. But remember that marriage is a gift of God for you. It's his plan for you. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul, Paul also says to the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is well for them to remain unmarried as I was. Paul enjoyed being single. But if they are not practicing self-control, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. Paul was writing at a time when they thought Jesus was going to come back at any time, and so he downplayed marriage. But uh, to those who want to be in a relationship, he says, marry, marry. It's, it's a gift of God for you. And so if that's you, come and talk to us about marriage. But of all, above all, remember, while the person we, are, we married, um, the person that we've married, well, they're sinners. And as sinners, they're bound to let you down, to fail you. But, but in, in the midst of all of that, our ultimate groom will not. You see, Scripture is full of imagery of Christ, the groom, and the church as his bride. And while the church is full of sinners, Christ lays down his life for her and presents her unblemished, covered in his blood, redeemed and whole. In the Old Testament, there is a story about the prophet Hosea. God has Hosea marry a prostitute named Gomer. So she has two strikes against her there. <laughs> and while, and you know, Gomer did as Gomer does. She was unfaithful to Hosea. And now Hosea was well within his rights to divorce Gomer. But God instructed him instead not only to stay with her, but to pursue her. Because that is the kind of love that God has for his people. A love that will never let us go, no matter how unfaithful we are. And so know this, single person, you are loved. And know this, married person, God will never let you go. And especially to you divorced person, God will never stop pursuing you out of his great love for you. Thanks be to God. We'll see you in church.